Hello Gems, welcome to another episode of TRs in Tech. I'm your host, Shelly Benhoff, and today I'm talking to Nikima Prophet about being your authentic self. She is passionate about developer relations and she is an AWS community builder. We talked about her journey into tech from a dance background, how ADHD has impacted her career, and learning how to speak up and live your truth. Without further ado, on to the episode. Hey, Nikima, thank you so much for being here and welcome to the show. I am so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's get started with your story. How did you get started in tech? Okay. I have to like, I have to work on not telling a very long story. (laughs) No, it's a podcast as long as you want. (laughs) Okay. So I've always like, even as a kid, I was really into computers and anything techy, like even like my toys, like I always like things with screens (laughs) on them. Um, But I did not um, originally, like, even though I had this interest and, you know, through school, like I would take all of the computer classes I could, but that was not like my career goal. (laughs) My career aspiration was not to like grow up and work with computers or on computers. (laughs) I wanted to be a professional dancer um, and I kind of chose that goal pretty late in life for like a dancer. (laughs) Like I didn't start when I was three or five or six. I started when I was a preteen and I wanted to dance professionally. So I um, got myself into all the public schools that had dance programs so that I could take classes all the time. And I, that was my, my no plan B life goal (laughs) is like get out of Sacramento, which is where I was born and raised. Nice. Uh, Go dance professionally. And so I kind of like, I made some progress on that. Like I I danced through middle school and high school. And after high school, I was accepted to two dance programs. One was in New York at the Ailey School. um, And the other was in California at Cal Arts. So technically... I, Cal Arts wasn't really an option because it's a private, you know, art school and it's very pricey. So, but regardless, I wanted to go to, to New York. So like Ailey, the Ailey school was the, the obvious choice. Um, and I did that. I went for the summer, the summer of 20, Oh, 2001. <laughs> okay. It was the summer of 2001. I went to the summer intensives program at the Ailey School, and then I was going to come back um, and start my program in that fall of 2001. And I did that. Um, and 9 11 happened and, you know, rocked my world. And that was kind of like the beginning of the end of my, my full-time dancing. I didn't last much longer in school after that, at uh, September in 2001 and never made it back. <laughs> so like yeah. I, I had, like at the time, I didn't know that it was going to be the end. Cause I was like, I, I'll, I'll get back to it. Like I'll, I'll, I'll take classes on my own. I'll do this. Like, it didn't work out that way. Um, so after that, uh, I tried to stay in New York. I did, I never did. Um, I don't know when I actually kind of like gave up on the dream of like getting back into dance. It was probably when I, I couldn't get back into school. <laughs> so I had left the Ailey school and I tried uh, re-auditioning for the program and I didn't get back in (laughs) so I think that was probably when I was like oh okay this might not be the thing that I do um and also living in New York I'm not from there I didn't really have family there Mm -hmm. 
um, it's not an easy thing to do um, money wise or any other way. Like it's just not easy, not an easy city. Oh yeah. It's expensive. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I, but I did stay, I stayed in New York. I actually, yeah, I stayed in New York. Um, and I, I took some, some dance classes like at, at Hunter's college. I went uh, to a bunch of different schools in the city university system. Um, and this was before I was diagnosed with ADHD. So like now looking back, it's like, oh, the way I moved back then, like it makes sense <laughs> in hindsight, like that I just, I never stuck with anything much. Like dance was pretty much the only thing that I'd done for like longer than a few months, I feel like, or <laughs> like that I chose to do and that I stuck with. Um, so like I went to, three or four different schools in New York. And like in one of the schools, I was able to take dance classes and that was fun. Um, But I was just trying to make it. (laughs) I was just trying to like get to like a standard of living that didn't feel horrible. Um, And one of the things that I tried uh, was going into pharmacy tech. So I, yeah, so the certification process Uh, process for pharmacy technicians in New York there was no uh, school school and like externship requirement like you could just take this test and then you're a certified pharmacy technician so I took the test I studied for it took it got certified and started looking for a job as a pharmacy tech and I got a job in a retail pharmacy um, and I was shocked <laughs> that I was paid so little. Uh, I think it was something like seven dollars, seven fifty an hour, something like that. Oh my god! When I applied, um, I hadn't gotten the result back, or I hadn't gotten the certificate back. But like, I, I think I knew I'd passed the test, um, and they were like, "Oh yeah, you'll probably get a raise." Uh, oh. Certification. Yeah. And I thought for like a 75 cent raise. So like it was not significant at all. Yeah. Um and but I knew like the money, like the the better money in pharmacy tech was if you were like in a hospital, like a hospital pharmacy or something like that. Um but that's what I was doing. Um and I kind of feel like that's a uh, precursor like to my tech career because I had already like I knew how to code (laughs) I knew how to code I had taken you know I taught my taught myself through like messing around on computers at home and took programming classes I took web design classes in high school um but again it wasn't my thought for like a career but when I got into the pharmacy tech I was like I can study for this and, and like possibly uh, move my career forward or like start making like decent money. And that didn't happen, but it kind of like taught me something about like who I am. I'm like, okay, so I can do technical things. (laughs) And it wasn't until I got pregnant really that I started thinking I can do technical things and I need to start getting paid decently Mm -hmm. (laughs) for the work that I do because now I'm going to have this baby um, and I do not want to struggle like this my whole life with a baby. Um, So it was after I got pregnant that I really started looking seriously at my tech career. (laughs) And I enrolled while I was still pregnant. I enrolled in uh, this, I moved home. I left New York because it was too much. I was like, I need to go where my support system is. And I don't want to struggle like this. And, you know, yeah. So I decided to go go home, moved in with my parents. And I enrolled in school to do, um, to start a web developer certificate at the junior college. 
And uh, this was back in like 2000, 2006. Uh, and so I was kind of, online classes were not as widely available yeah. as they are now. And I was taking a lot of like what they call hybrid classes. So I would take classes that were available online and I would take hybrid classes, which were like part online and part like a few hours in class. Um, and I did that and it took me something like five years <laughs> to finish a one year certificate because that's I- fine. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares how long it took? <laughs> yeah, I did it. I finished it. Um, but yeah, and I, and you know, in the meantime, I had another kid. <laughs> so I had children like pretty much back to back. Nice. Uh, so those first, you know, few years, it's like, oh my gosh, I just have two babies. Like it's, it's a lot. Um, so I, I, I really relied on those online classes and waited for them to become available. And so I finished the certificate and I was like, okay, let's go get a job. And before I even finished it, like um, like my professor had recommended me for some like mentoring program and like people were able to like get their first jobs <laughs> through this program. And it's just like everything that I tried back then, like it was just leading to dead ends. Like I, got into the mentorship program and then my mentor ghosted me. <laughs> like I never heard from him again after like that first meeting. And I was like, okay. And then I, I finished my certificate and I was like, okay, let's go get jobs. And it's just like, even back then in like 20, what year was that? 2012, 2013 ish. Mm-hmm. Um, even back then I was like, I want a remote job. I know that you can do this job from home. Um, but back then, you know, I don't think I realized how rare (laughs) that is for like someone to get their first job in tech and like to be working remotely. Um, and I didn't even know exactly what I was looking for. I think I was, I was just trying to get in, I was trying to get in as a web developer, I think, but, um, wasn't finding anything and feeling like, um, okay, so I'm gonna go out there and, and try to gain some experience so that I can and get into the community. And that's what I did. I started going to meetups. I went to a startup weekend, which was kind of like a pivot point for me because um, I went to this startup weekend to practice my dev skills. <laughs> and I signed up as a developer and it was a pivot point because this was kind of the first time that I left my kids for that long to do anything. And it wasn't really leaving my kids. Like I didn't sleep over there or anything, but it was like a whole weekend where you're going to build a startup in a weekend and demo it. Um, so I did that and my team won. I was like, Ooh, wow. Like, like a, a, a switch <laughs> went off in my head where it's like, my, my work has value and my ideas have value and I can be the one to, to solve some of these problems that I'm facing. Um, another thing that came out of that startup weekend is immediately after um, the person who had the idea for the startup decided that, you know, she was the CEO and, and not only that, like she was going to like go pursue this startup idea and like take the team prizes and like just do her own thing and like fire us and I was like oh okay that's what we're not going to (laughs) do and I have always been a very timid shy you know quiet person and like throughout my school experience like my college experience get earning that certificate I was bulldozed by the stronger personalities like they would kind of like take over the projects. I would be uh, pushed to the side or like, you know, given like some trivial thing to do while they just take over and do everything. And so this startup weekend where it's like, oh, my work is front and center. And my work was, you know, a contributor to our win. So that was like my villain 
well, I'm not a villain, but it's like my origin story <laughs> where it's like, <laughs> hell no, people are not going to do this to me anymore. I'm not going to allow people to just do whatever to me. Like you're not, I'm not going to be a doormat. And yeah. I had left my kids for the first time and it was such a significant thing. And it's so significant to feel recognized for my work when, you know, I've always been overlooked. And then for you to like come in and say, and I mean, it wasn't even just like, I'm going to go off and do, <laughs> do this on my own. It was, I saw her pitch our work as a team with someone who wasn't even on the team. It was just a lot. So I was like, this is what we're, I'm not doing this anymore. So I had like a moment of boldness. <laughs> Um, cause it was just like, right after it was like immediately after when she was like, yeah, um, you know, I'm going to take the prizes and cause like some of the prizes were like app development, like I think meeting with a lawyer or something like that. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to take the prizes and just like, you know, do the company and you guys can, can have the prizes that you can do on your own. And I was like, no. Um, so it was like such a big moment for me to like when and then to have that happen immediately after I was like this is not going to happen and I ended up contacting the organizers got we were disqualified <laughs> so our our win doesn't count um we were disqualified and you know second place became first place mm. we got those prizes but um it was kind of like the start of me thinking of myself as um an entrepreneur, like I could like create businesses that solve the problems that I'm facing. And that's what I tried to do. I'm not, okay. I won't say I tried to do it. I did create a business. Um, no, I created a company. <laughs> <laughs> there you it go. Hasn't really been a business because it has not made money, <laughs> um, but I created a company. The company still exists. I'm still working on like paying the taxes on it right now. Oh, I um, hear you. <laughs> yeah. But I'm learning, like, just looking back, I, I tried so hard to make it work without enough resources. And I didn't have, I didn't have the, like any of the resources I needed. And I, I was queen of getting stuff for free. <laughs> like I, I, I even got incorporated for free, which is nice, interesting, but you know, there's only so far that free can take you like you, it's not likely that you can build a successful business from like debt and, yeah, you know, being under-resourced. Absolutely. And I wasn't even just under-resourced money-wise. It's like, you know, I'm a single mom and like I noticed, like I would do these accelerator programs and things like that. And I'm like, the people who are kind of okay have partners. <laughs> like they have someone who can take some of this load off while they're like going, going in on this business. Yeah. Um, and I think that's not mentioned a lot, like where it's like, not even just like the, the monetary support, but just like having, like if you're a parent and you have another parent, <laughs> present to kind of support you while you're trying to do something other than parenting um I feel like it's not talked in, about enough like how important those those partners are for like support absolutely I I think a lot of people assume that I'm like alone or that I I started my company you know alone I've pretty much never been alone I've I've always had my uh husband who produces stuff and my sister who's actually older she is like operations because like you said with the taxes and you know all of that so I'm terrible at paperwork so I, I was just like hey you know but for a really long time like they were paid very very little and only now is it like a job to them you know, yeah. Um, there's a lot to unpack on what you said. I think, first of all, I think that it's really, really cool that you were a uh, dancer. And I would suggest 
don't stop, at least practice. Mm-hmm. Um, cause in, in school, yeah, I, I also, you know, tech wasn't my, my focus. I sang actually, and I really wanted to be like on Broadway or opera or something like that. And, you know, I just, I just didn't believe in myself then, but like now I'm like, I could incorporate it into this, you know, and I've always thought object oriented opera, (laughs) do something with like code. And (laughs) I wish I knew her name, but there was like a software engineer who was on Broadway and she like, she she returned to her role in Wicked as she was like, I feel like I heard this yeah, yeah. like they called her up and she like <laughs> went on Broadway and performed like she had like this whole career as a <laughs> software engineer after Broadway which is amazing to me like yeah <laughs> I love that I think that it's interesting to combine um creative skills and technical skills I think that most of the speakers that I know come from creative, like, you know, either acting or improv, like to be comfortable speaking to an audience, especially a lot of us are more like introverted. Like, I don't think that I've left my neighborhood in a month. Honestly, (laughs) I go outside for walks, but you know, it's about it. Mm -hmm. Um, How does a person who is um, introverted like do conference speaking and like developer relations and stuff like that Ooh, okay so for me (laughs) I've I've just come a long way um I think at some point I decided that it felt better to just show up as I am um and to be seen um, then it felt, you know, to hide and, and to be afraid of, of like, yeah, of being seen, <laughs> to be afraid of being visible. Um, but when I started speaking in public, which started out as like those pitches for this company I started, um, it was awful. <laughs> like I would cry, shake, sweat, all of that. I'm with you. <laughs> But when I did that, I was so embarrassed and I used to be so like, it's really recent that I allow myself to cry because I would try to hold it back so much. Like I I had this idea that crying did not serve a purpose. (laughs) Like, why am I crying? It's not going to fix anything. Like, I just want things to change. Like crying is not going to help, but I would cry anyway, but I would fight it so hard I'd be covering my face I would smile through through tears like I would fight it so hard and someone told me like your tears have a purpose <laughs> like they're they're like cleansing there's like hormones that are released and things like that um okay. um so it took me like until a few years ago to to allow myself to cry but even when I was such a mess in front of other people, um, even when I was such a mess, like no one was mean to me about it. You know, it, I always felt like people, um, people connected with me and it felt weird. Cause I'm like, why are you like, why is this okay for you? <laughs> Like I'm up here, I'm a mess and I'm like crying, but like people seem to appreciate vulnerability. And that is one of my, uh, my mutant superpowers is that I'm very open and vulnerable. And I like, when I stopped fighting it, (laughs) I guess it feels more like a superpower, um, and when I recognize that, like people, people don't mind it. Like people are like, it's actually how I connect with people. And a lot of people will say like, it's, it's refreshing that someone is being open and vulnerable or like when I am the way I am, it gives other folks permission to be the way they are. Totally. Um, 
So I just started, started out being very, <laughs> very bad at speaking. And then at some point I decided that it's important to say what I have to say. And it's important that people hear my perspective because it's, well, because it's a unique perspective, but not just that, um, it's an under, under-recognized <laughs> perspective, especially in tech. Yeah. And I heard on a podcast when someone said, um, you're an expert in your own experience. And that has stuck with me since I heard it. And to me, it, it says that um, no matter who's asking me to speak, I have something that I'm an expert in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that that is like the life I've lived, the things I've experienced, my, the, my thoughts. And not only am I the only expert in that, um, it's valuable. <laughs> it's valuable and it's a service to others to share that. So once I started thinking that way, I was like, I think it takes away some of the, the you know, doubt or, or low confidence that you might feel when you're like, oh, well, what can I say to this group of people? Well, I always have something to say because I always have this thing that is my expertise. And I'm the only one who can say that. So no matter who I'm talking to, that expertise doesn't change. You know, it's, it's like immutable. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, authenticity, I, I always tell people, you don't choose to be yourself. <laughs> you choose to conform to social norms. And like, I, I have some people in my family that aren't like really supportive of that kind of thing and would really like for everybody to be, you know, Stepford, Stepford wife type person. Um, and it took me a really long time. I was just saying today, like it took me 36 years of my life to be like, I stutter, you know, like, <laughs> I know nobody can tell, but it's really, really hard for me to talk. And so sometimes I just need people to know that. And then after I said that, and nobody judged me, they actually thought more highly of me and were like inspired. And I think when people struggle with um, anything, you know, like <laughs> ADHD, and I'm also bipolar, which, you know, they share a lot of common symptoms. And um, I was just wondering, how does that um, impact your work or life? Ooh, okay. So with the ADHD, um, I, I like to say I'm I'm neurodivergent because ADHD has been identified, but there's also, you know, other things <laughs> like depression was, has been there. Uh, and I think a lot of, you know, how my brain works today has been there my entire life. You know, like it, it wasn't something that came as a result of, of, an event or anything like that. I think it's always been there. Um, so like being diagnosed as an adult is so it's bittersweet, <laughs> you know, it's bittersweet because you've had this whole lifetime of, you know, basically you develop like, or I develop this negative voice inside that says like, why is this so hard? Why can't you do this? Like, uh, you feel shame and guilt about some of these things that are not really in your control, you know, like, um, and the, with the ADHD traits, like there's things like time blindness and, um, you know, um, yeah, time blindness is one where it's like, you'll be, 
you can't visualize time and like um, you end up being late for things or you end up, you know, yeah, not understanding, like not being able to gauge like how long something is going to take. <laughs> so it's like, oh, I can still get ready. And then like the, also like the, the low dopamine where it's like, you have a thing to do, but you can't do it until, until it's urgent. Right. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> like things are either right now or later. So until it becomes right now, it's like, it's really hard to get gauge, like giving yourself enough time to do the thing. So you end up late and you end up, you know, people take that as disrespect. Like you don't respect my time. Why are you showing up late? It's just like, so like you start to internalize all of these judgments about the way you are <laughs> and like a lot of it becomes negative and they say like children with uh like neurodivergent children like here like you know tens of thousands of more negative messages you know in their childhood than you know neurotypical children and it's like you start to internalize those things and you start to hear, you know, th those voices from outside of teachers and parents who say like, you can do better and uh, you're not meeting your potential. Like those get internalized and it's like, not anyone's fault. <laughs> it's not, it's not their fault. It's not your fault that you weren't given the environment that you needed, that you weren't given the support, you know, and the tools that you needed to be successful. But it's like years and years of that. And then one day someone, you know, one day you realize none of that was my fault. Like all of those things that I've been beating myself up about, I couldn't help it. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a character flaw. It wasn't, I'm being irresponsible. I'm being rude. It was, you know, it was traits <laughs> of the way my brain works. And I didn't, and it's, and it's a relief in a way where it's like, oh my gosh, like everything, all of these things that, you know, have been hurtful or hard, like there's a reason for them. So that part is a relief, but it's also sad because it's like, what would it have been like if I had what I needed? Yeah, years. absolutely. Um, I, I feel that because I refused to believe that I was bipolar for like 17 years just in 2020 I was like yeah okay this is a problem I think those five doctors were right when I was a teenager <laughs> like five different doctors I just I don't know and now that I'm like medicated and I have a routine and I understand what's going on it's so much better I can't believe I put myself through this in, in my twenties and thirties. Like I didn't even, you know, want to say I might have a problem until I was like 40. It, please don't do this. Anybody listening, just take care of you. It's, it's really um, important. Yeah. To like understand what's happening and then, you know, understanding your triggers, especially and, all of that is, um, you know, really important. And I think that speakers who are honest about what's happening in their lives and who are authentic, we're going to say that a lot, um, are, are more engaging. I, if I'm listening to a speaker, I want to relate to them. I want to like them. I, and all of that, it's like, if, if I like someone, if they're talking about something that I don't care about, or I don't know anything about, like, I'll still listen. And that's powerful, I think. Yeah. Um, so let's get to the stuff. <laughs> Have you ever had any, um, not great experiences, especially as a black woman who is very under underrepresented in tech. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I feel like 
what's hard about talking about this is that sometimes it's it's you just get the, a feeling you know or like you get a feeling but you can't really you know prove <laughs> you can't really prove it like I have a feeling that something went a certain way in this interview process and it has something to do with my race and my gender um but I can't prove it you know so it's like I think that um I mean I would say it's negative to feel othered (laughs) all the time you know yes and I have so many different intersections because you know like I'm I'm black I'm a woman. So like just those, you know, very broad categories already puts me in a very underrepresented group Mm -hmm. in X spaces, but I'm also neurodivergent. I'm also, you know, don't have a college degree. I also, um, come from, you know, middle to low income. I am a single parent. (laughs) I'm a parent, like all of these different, um, categories that make it less likely to see people like me (laughs) in the spaces I'm in. Um, So just by the nature of there not being so many people who are coming with all of the things that I'm coming and like making it, (laughs) you know, by the nature of that, I feel othered a lot of the times. And I Mm -hmm. feel like, you know, the people who are, you know, majoritized, like, the white men and white women, um, some of them have been super supportive and, and have sponsored me and, you know, like put my names, my name in front of opportunities and things like that. But I also feel like I'm still othered. Like, I still feel like there are times that like people are, are trying really hard to to relate and accommodate, but it's still like from a, you know, you're not like us. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So I, I do appreciate, you know, help and sponsorship and, and all of that. And I do believe that I deserve it. I don't, I don't think of myself as a token or, you know, as a diversity hire Mm -hmm. ever, but I, um, but yeah, the truth is, like the, the one tech job that I had that I'm not in anymore, I was one of two black women in the company, you know, and neither of us were in a technical role. Like mm-hmm. I, my job in tech was not a technical role. It was uh, marketing and community management. Um, even though I am technical and I snuck in some technical work <laughs> because uh, I was working with the open source community and I got a chance to um, redesign the website, the spinnaker.io website. So I, I snuck in some technical work, but my it mm-hmm. wasn't my job description to write code ever. Um, so just the nature of like being the only one or one of a few is, it feels alienating. So I would say that part is, is negative. Um, and also just the never knowing if, you know, never knowing if, you know, it was, it was a bias that got in the way of, yeah. of moving forward. Exactly. I think, um, what I want people to start to think is that, we're all people in tech, you know, we don't need to separate ourselves by, by women or race or whatever, like we're all people in tech, but the sad reality is that, that that's not the reality at the moment, (laughs) you know, Um, we have a long way to go. I would like to see more executives who are who are black I would like to see multiple executives who are black instead of them hiring just one you know do DEI (laughs) yes yeah oh my god like Disney put a white man 
in charge of DEI. And I was like, <laughs> that should never be the case. Honestly, it should be a person of color at, at, all, at all times, you know, or have a team with, with each type of person or whatever represented. Um, because we keep making these like products and, and sites and stuff that are not accommodating to everybody. They are accommodating to the majority. And I think for me, like, especially what I've seen with, um, camera, um, recognition and and stuff like that people with dark skin like it doesn't work for them and stuff and I if you had had a black person on your team like that could have probably been avoided <laughs> people don't consider that I think and um it's it's a shame right now I would love to see it change and I'm trying like I really um I'm, I'm very vocal when somebody says something that isn't right. And I'm just like, you know, you're not supposed to say that. And here's why. And sometimes they'll like push back and I'll just be like, you know what? I just gave you information. You do with it what you want, but I, I will speak up all the time. It's just awful. I think, um, when we have these experiences where people um, take advantage of us because we, um, you know, tend to work harder or something like that, I hate that. That's a predatory practice in employment that I've seen throughout my career. I would always work the hardest on the team and get the least recognition and sometimes no recognition at all. And the kudos would, would go to the ass that, you know, <laughs> worked part-time. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no. And that leads to us um, having these, you know, intrusive thoughts about our skill set and just overall imposter syndrome. Um, how do you handle <laughs> feeling like a imposter in tech? Oh, yeah. My thing with imposter syndrome is I've got beef. I've got beef with the term <laughs> because I feel like a lot of times it is thrust upon people um, that it's not necessarily, you know, people, I mean, some of it is, I don't want to say like it doesn't exist or like it's not real, but I think especially like speaking as a black woman, um, I feel like it's something that we are, are kind of led to expect is going to happen to us. And like, we're led to think that that's a normal thing that we're going to experience in these spaces. And I want to challenge that <laughs> idea of like, why should we expect to feel like an imposter? Why should we expect to feel like a fraud in these spaces? I think part of the problem is that we are, it, it feels like gaslighting. You know, it feels like people are saying, um, you know, like this is a you thing. Like you in your mind are thinking that you don't belong here, that your your work doesn't measure up or that you're, uh, you're a fraud that's going to be found out. And it's like, I never came with those ideas. You came with those ideas for me. And it's like, I'm being treated that way. I'm tr being treated like I'm a fraud. Like I have to prove my worth every step of the way. So of course you're not going to feel comfortable. Of course it's not going to feel good. So why are we saying like, oh yeah, imposter syndrome is totally normal. We all go through it. But I just don't think that's the right <laughs> approach. I think the right a better approach would be to acknowledge that things are not fair. Things are not fair. You are not treated like, you know, John is treated. <laughs> You're not getting the same experience. You're not getting the same acceptance or, uh, you know, encouragement that more majoritized people are getting. Like we can acknowledge that without saying that it's in my head. 
Cause, cause me, that's what it feels like where they're saying like, oh, you feel like an imposter. You have imposter syndrome. It's like, no, I know I'm awesome. I know I'm coming with skills. I know that I belong here as much as you do, but that's not the feedback I'm getting. So it's like, you're, you're telling me I have imposter syndrome because I'm reacting to the feedback that I'm getting, which is you don't belong here. You know, I'm not sure you belong here. You don't fit in here. So I think it's more of, you know, a systemic problem than an individual imposter syndrome. And I think when we tell people like, yeah, it's totally normal, like to feel like that, I think that's, it's putting the, the onus on them to fix a problem that they didn't create. I love that perspective. I've never heard that before, but that's so true. I think that as, as women, we are, you know, we've internalized that we have to fix things on our end. Mm-hmm. No, not really. <laughs> you know, like if we were treated with respect all the time and, you know, don't have to prove ourselves to every single person that we need out in the world. Um, like I, recently purchased a car and you know like I'm with my husband the guy's trying to talk to my husband but in my household I'm the breadwinner I I handle the financial stuff so I I already had like um finances you know (laughs) worked out um and this guy was just like not, not having anything to do with me I hate that it, it isn't even in tech. It's just out in the world. You know, no one looks at us and thinks really successful developer, you know, conference speaker in tech. They think we're someone's mom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it. Not that there's anything wrong with being an assistant, but absolutely. Yeah. Never assumed to be the technical one. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so what, what um, advice would you have for people who are interested in, in tech and have no idea like how to start? So my advice, okay. I think first you should look at, you know, where your skills, like where your existing skills are and interests and see like where that maps to a tech role because there are so many ways to be in tech. And I think a lot of people get discouraged or don't feel smart enough or don't feel like they know enough math (laughs) to get into tech because they're thinking like, this is all computer engineering. And, you know, like even a lot of us who code are not doing computer engineering, we're doing like, we're writing, you know, scripting languages and things like that. So, which takes no math. (laughs) Yeah. So I, um, I would say like, don't get caught like too hung up on learning to code. If you don't like to code, I actually like to code. I would, I do it for free. I do it for fun. I have done it, you know, without any thought of, of making money (laughs) from it. I like to code. Like it's something I've always been interested in. Well, not always, but pretty much always been interested in. So if you don't, (laughs) if you don't like to code, it doesn't appeal to you at all. Like, I don't think that you should force yourself to like go to a boot camp and learn to code and like try to learn to like it. I think you should go with what you're already interested in, what you're already good at and just, uh, fill in the gap to like make it fit in a tech role because like, like there's, if you're experienced in customer service and you're great at it and you want to keep doing that, you can make a lot more money in a tech company doing customer service, customer success than you would, you know, as like at, at the gap or something like that, you know? (laughs) Yeah. So I think that there are so many roles out there and if you're artistic and creative, there are artistic and creative roles. So I don't think everyone needs to like forget about all of their skills, all of their, their experience, their life experience, their work experience and learn a code. If like there are ways to do the thing that you do in a tech, cause every, every company 
is a tech company now. Like every company touches technology. Yeah. So uh, I just think a lot of people cut themselves off because they're intimidated by, you know, this idea of like, you have to be super smart and super mathy and super, you know, have a college degree. Like so many, there's so much mythology <laughs> like around like how people got started in, in tech. And I think when you were talking earlier about, you know, being a singer or a dancer or a musician, like there are so many people like that. And I feel like there's this, uh, there's this stereotype of like, who is the technical person? And a lot of that comes from, you know, the, the first people to have access to computers and to have, you know, access to, you know, the kind of social class where you can play around with computers and play around with, with coding and, and programming uh, just on your own time. Like that whole idea of like, oh, Apple was started in a garage or something like that. Like the, that, I feel like that persona has kind of taken, taken over everyone's minds of like, who's in tech? Like, it's like, nerdy white guys who, you know, have poor social skills, right? And I yeah. think that's may have been true <laughs> for like the founders of some of these companies and things like that. But right now, there's so many of us and there's so many of us that have a place or should have a place in tech. Um, that it's, and it's not just that, that persona of like, super, you know, geeky, super like, antisocial, you know, tech nerd, like there are so many ways to be in tech. And I feel like the part of the, the whole reason why people have imposter syndrome, people feel like outsiders is because it's been kind of gatekept because those, those folks, you know, they were able to start companies with their, their friends, you know, and like you're starting a company with a few friends of course, like they're going to be people kind of like you, <laughs> you know? So I just felt like they didn't want to, or maybe they tried to hold back, like including people who weren't like them. And I, I mean, now I'm seeing it like, and now there's, there's all of these coding boot camps and schools and things like that. And people are coming in from, you know, this is like their career switching from, you know, being teachers and, you know, medical professionals, all types, all types of people are coming in. Um, I just want people to kind of like get rid of that, <laughs> that idea of who belongs and who, who is likely to be here because so many of us, like we're just bringing in so many diverse perspectives and everyone has a place. I think if you want a tech job, there's a place for you. And if that means, you know, picking up new skills, like if you don't mind coding, like it's a, it's a good place to go. You can make a lot of money. You don't have to have a degree. Like that's another thing. You don't have to have a degree. You can make a lot of money. Um, but I just, I want people to like get rid of that idea of like this type is like looks the part and this type doesn't um, because there's a place for all of us. There should be a place for all of us because uh, technology is touching all of us <laughs> it's touching billions of people and like we don't want a, a room full of white people or white men deciding you know on technology that's going to affect the lives like literally <laughs> of people you know all over the world like when you're talking about facial recognition and it doesn't work on dark skin and we're having the justice system use these flawed <laughs> you know AI and yeah. facial recognition and people are getting longer sentences and people are getting locked up because these things are failing and they were never ever properly designed to work on the people who are being affected by it. So mm -hmm. we definitely all have a place um, and we all should be in there. Absolutely. <laughs> so finding, finding your, finding what you like to do and seeing like where that lines up with the tech world. That's my advice. I love that. I think people need to remember that tech is more than coding. You know, <laughs> there are a lot of different things that you can do. 
Well, we're at the end of our time. I'm so incredibly sad. I will have to have you back because we didn't even talk about like half the things that we, we had planned, um, which that happens all of the time. Um, so yeah, to just kind of wrap up, can you tell people um, where they can find you online? Sure. Um, I'm pretty most... Uh active on Twitter. I've been hosting a lot of Twitter spaces. A lot of them are recorded. So my at there is dev underscore Nakima. And I do have my own website that I don't update as much. And that is nakimaprofit.com. Awesome. I will put links to all of that in the show notes slash description. Thank you so much for spending you know, this afternoon with me. It was super fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Awesome. If you would like to support us, please like subscribe and share this episode with your fellow gems. Let me know in the comments, what other topics you would like me to cover and follow TRs and tech on social media. Thanks for watching or listening and have a great day.